Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmad Awadallah. I'm a senior principal research manager here at Microsoft Research. I'm delighted to have uh, Donkey Chen, Song Han, and Zheng Feng Zhao join me today in this discussion session about efficiency and adaptability of large-scale AI models. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today at the MSR Research Summit, everyone. So let's get started. Uh, large and pre-trained models wouldn't have the impact they have now without scale. Uh, but scale also requires immense resources from both the data and the computational files, making the models generally not very efficient. Uh, so to kick off the discussion, I'll uh, pose a question, and I'd appreciate if you guys give like a quick uh, one-line introduction about yourself and your thoughts about the question. So the question is, uh, in your opinion, what are the most important dimensions of efficiency that you think the deep learning community should invest in? Uh, let's start with uh, Danki. Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Chi Chen. I'm a system professor at Princeton University. So my main research field is natural language processing. And these days, I've been very interested in how to make NLP systems and uh, large-scale creation language models run faster and more efficient. So getting back to your question. So I think the first um, very important dimension, in my opinion, is actually data efficiency. So today, we have a lot of the of large-scale pre-trained models, but these models can still be used for many years. But still, we will have lots of new tasks and the new applications that we need to solve. And how can we actually, we cannot collect a large amount of annotated examples for all these new tasks. This is not a sustainable solution. So I'm personally very excited by this uh, research direction of how to use prompts uh, to solve NLP problems. And how can we actually um, teach models to learn from the instructions or even generalize um, between the different instructions? Um, I think it's a very exciting and promising direction for me. And uh, I will just talk about another important direction uh, or dimension I think is very important is actually the pre-training cost. So these days, the basic pre-training is basically dominated by um, several like um, major technology com tech companies. And it's basically because um, just training these models are very expensive and it's basically out of reach for most uh, res uh, academia, academic research labs. But still, I think there are a lot of people who actually want to build their own models, their own pre-trained models, either for like specific domains such as like a biomedical domains or scientific documents, or even the current pre-trained models actually can easily get outdated. So how can we actually train um, these pre-trained models from the scratch in this uh, academic budget. I think it's a very, very, very important direction that we want to start in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dunchi. Uh, so Song, do you have anything to add? Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Song Han. I'm an assistant professor at MIT. We focus on tiny ML and efficient deep learning from uh, hardware to the algorithms. Uh, so we feel uh, for natural language processing, uh, there is a huge redundancy in the natural language. There, therefore, there, are, there is a lot of op opportunity to remove those redundancies. Uh, for example, uh, in a sentence, uh, human language can be highly inefficient, right? Language inefficient, those two words probably cover the whole meaning of this sentence with five words, right? So there is a huge opportunity to perform such token level, head level pruning. Well, uh, the, uh, the attention mechanism uh, pruning is fundamentally different from conventional model compression techniques like weight pruning, since in the attention mechanism, there is no weight. So there is a lot of challenge for um, applying those conventional model compression techniques to uh, natural language. Uh, recently, another line of research came for a neural architecture search, try to search efficient architecture for language, um, language uh, tasks. Uh, however, uh, there's a study showing that uh, the evolved transformer, basically the neural architecture, uh, Evolve the transformer with neural architecture search is taking as much carbon footprint as five cars in their whole lifetimes, like 6,000, um, 600,000 pounds of CO2 emission. So that's a lot of uh, uh, very badly for, for the environment. Uh, therefore, uh, it's very, it's high time that we put a lot of attention on this green AI, especially for NLP tasks. Um, and hopefully pave the way for this tiny ML green AI to make uh, these tags greener, smaller, faster, and more accessible to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Song. Uh, Jianfeng? Hi. 
Hi, uh, I'm Kim Pungo. I'm the uh, distinguished scientist of Microsoft Research. I, I completely agree with Dan Chi and the song, and I also want to point out that I strongly believe that the uh, adaptive autonomy, uh, the ability of adapting itself in a changing environment by continual learning, is the most important feature for future AI systems. Yeah, you know that as we are building hundreds of or even thousands of new AI applications every week, it is prohibitively expensive to maintain them all. And I also want to point out the recent neuroscience research reveals that actually human brains are remarkably energy efficient in learning, right? But many of these biological features, such as spatial temporal dynamics, that support the adaptive flexibility and the efficient learning of humans have not been yet translated into the design of these neural language model systems. So I also believe that biologically inspired deep learning is one of the most promising research directions. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Jen Feng. And, and Dante and Song, both of you mentioned something very interesting about the uh, gains or the benefits that we get to stand gain to to gain stand to gain if we actually invest in efficiency, ranging from increasing accessibility to sustainability and and uh, saving in environmental costs. But there are so many other things that we stand to gain as well, from economic costs, environmental costs, increasing accessibility, agility of development. So efficiency is not becoming more an afterthought, but it's actually a requirement for next generation of large scale AI. So I was uh, thinking if you have any thoughts about what risks, uh, what, what, what are the risks that we face if we don't invest in efficiency as we think about building the next generation of AI models, both from the developer perspective, but both from the environmental perspective, the end user perspective? Yeah, I would still argue that um, it's a, a pre-training and fine-tuning cost for a lot of the academic researchers would be a still very important problem to address next. So these days we are getting bigger and bigger uh, language models. Even like uh, if we cannot afford the cost to train these models or fine tune these language models, how can we even have access to them, to the, this model, for example, the GPU-3 model? I think still like an unresolved problem. So that would be something that we can invest um, next. Great. And Song, I think we lost you for a second, but like we have you back now. Uh, we were basically talking about the uh, what do we what do we stand to gain by investing in efficiency, and what do we risk if we ignore efficiency as we think about the next generation of large AI models. Yeah. So we think we'd like to be inclusive for different walks of people to benefit from AI and democratize it and make AI more accessible. So, for example, we may have people that have high-end phones and people with low-end phones. We want to be inclusive for users who have low-end low phones, who have less computation budget, right? And be able to deploy AI not only on the cloud, but also on the edge devices to better pr preserve the privacy, right? So currently, there is still a long way, a huge gap between what we have and what we need. So especially also considering the environmental issue that we definitely don't want to uh, have a language model take as much carbon footprint as much as five cars in their whole lifetimes. So think about the whole global warming issue. Um, these are all important factors if we risk not doing such research. Absolutely. And Jen, think at Microsoft, we think about this problem both from the research side, but also from the practical side. Uh, so do you have any mm -hmm. comments on what, what, why does efficiency really matter in practice? Yeah, first of all, I think we really need to make all these giant models more accessible uh, to the wider audience, including uh, the research labs from academic, but if they don't have uh, large scale GPU class, they should be still should be able to use these models, adapt these models to new tasks. I think, first of all, uh, we should make this model probably more sparse and modular. Just like a search engine, right? It's not necessary for each research lab to build a Bing search engine, Google search engine from scratch. But take a look, uh, yeah, look at what's happening now. A lot of research labs are able to run experiments based on these uh, large scale search engines. I think sooner or later, 
this joint language model can be served in a similar manner. And that, that, that I think that's the first step. And from these big companies can do not cannot do everything for our uh, for, 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 for the people, right? So they we really need to democratize in the whole process. So search so engine is a good example. I would very like to see what what can be happening in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is also related to a point you made earlier, a uh, song about work on neural architecture search and mm -hmm. related to that, that the, the field has been really dominated by transformer based models first in language and now even making their way into vision. Uh, so uh, as you think about neural architecture search and other investments in improving and creating the architectures of the future, uh, such that they are inherently more efficient and easier to adapt. Do you think that should be a priority for uh, the research community to focus on? Yeah, so uh, from we have from our prior prior work, we find those neural architecture search uh, can be uh, consistently outperform human outperforming human design. So we get a world record by using Alibaba adopting our once for all model, achieving more than one million images per second of inference speed on eight A one hundred GPUs on the uh, on the ML perf benchmark, which is the Olympic game uh, for AI chips. Uh, so with the success in the uh, vision side, we feel it, uh, it promising on also on the language, natural language side. Um, and also, but the key bottleneck is we need to reduce the training cost, yeah. the search cost, uh, rather than five cars in higher lifetime of carbon emission. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some existing work that's showing very promising results, such as using the uh, West Fall approach, and we apply that to natural language as well, which is called the hardware aware transformer. Uh, basically reducing the search cost by a large margin so even research labs in schools like us can afford uh, to search a much better um, machine translation model that's uh, 2.7 times faster than the uh, evolved transformer so there's still opportunity i think great and uh, going back to uh, the comment you made earlier, Don Chi, about data efficiency and how it's very important for machine learning. Uh, we know that benchmarks have been playing a major role in many of the recent advances in deep learning. Uh, what are your thoughts on the current state of benchmarks used for evaluating large language models? And how can we think about the next generation of benchmarks that actually encourage creating more efficient and adaptable models? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And I also feel that the current leaderboard and the benchmarks do not really address the computational or efficiency side of the, uh, the LP models. Um, and uh, to be honest, like I've been working on like a pruning and distillation kind of work for LP models in the past year. And I found it pretty hard to actually compare the different types of published work because they use different hardwares. They just report, like, let's say, let's prune X percent of the, spark, the waste and uh, reach the um, accuracy Y on some specific benchmarks. But there isn't a way to actually really compare all this uh, existing work in a very like a unified benchmark or platform. I think that could be something that we can work on so we can create a benchmark or pla uh, create a platform so everyone can actually submit their models and then we can actually make a, make a fair comparison so we actually understand um, really what it does uh, state of the art in this line of research. Absolutely. And Jen Fink, do you have anything to add here? And especially uh, not just about benchmark, but about what do we need to do as a community generally for moving forward? I agree with Sanj. I think the, the, many of the current leaderboards in some sense are misleading because they, they, they assume a static environment and assume there are a lot of training data. Uh, and they only care the absolute performance on specific tasks. This is not how we use these AI systems in the real world. In the real world, it's always dynamic, and every time you only receive a small amount of data, and you need to adapt your system very, very quickly. So I think if we shift the folks from you know uh, data hungry model training styles to a fast adapting environment. We, we will help the, the academic to, 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 to focus on the really important uh, research problems for all of us. For this, I think we, we need to build new, uh, new data sets, new benchmarks that really simulate the real world situations. I think, uh, for example, in this uh, MSR summit, there are several talks uh, on uh, new benchmarks. 
So thank you so much, uh, Dan Chi, Song, and Jianfeng for the lively discussion. There are many more questions that I wanted to ask, but unfortunately, we ran out of time for this session. Uh, so thank you so much again for joining us for the discussion as well as for the research summit. And thanks everyone uh, who is listening in for joining us and hope you will enjoy uh, the next session of the deep learning and large scale AI track as well as the rest of the summit. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.